Good afternoon. I'm Paula Anderson with Sterling Carpet One and the 2020 Chamber of Commerce Board Chair. On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce is more than 1,000 members. I want to thank everyone for attending today's virtual luncheon. The Chamber wants to thank the many sponsors who make this event possible. They are Alaris Financial, All True Health System, Bremer Bank, Branson Bank and Trust, Grand Forks Herald, Grand Forks Region EDC, Sanford Health, University of North Dakota, Valley Senior Living, and WIDSA. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Northland and Community Technical College President, Dr. Dennis Bona. Dennis was appointed president July 1st, 2015. NCTC has campuses in Thief River Falls and East Grand Forks. As most of you know, Dennis will be retiring at the end of the year. We are all sad to see you go. You have done a great job leading Northland and connecting the college, faculty, and students to the Greater Grand Forks community. We will also miss you on the Chamber Board at BGA and Business After Hours. We are looking forward to working with Interim President Dr. Shannon Jesme. Our Chamber President Billy Wilfart is also Barry Wilfart is also looking forward to serving on the Selection Committee for the Northland President as the East Grand Forks Community Representative. We expect to see the Chancellor appoint a new president by July 1st, 2021. With that said, thank you so much, Dennis. You have served our community well, and we look forward to hearing your comments on the state of the college and wish, wish you well in your retirement. Let's welcome Northland Community and Technical College President, Dr. Dennis Bona. Hey, thank you, Paula. In fact, you've said about everything I was going to say, so I think we can just uh, be done here. No, we've got, we can go a little further than that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, do the share screen and hopefully I can make this work. Did that work? Let's see here. Can someone just wave their hand, maybe Brian, to say, do we got it going right? Correct? You're okay, good. super. You got All it right. going. All right, here we go. Okay, uh, uh, once again, when I looked at the, and uh, thank you to the uh, sponsors for today's event. And when I looked at the sponsor, uh, sponsors that we have, um, I, they're beyond sponsors to Northland and to this event. These are all community partners, all valued community partners that have contributed um, greatly to the success of Northland. And so I want to uh, thank you once again. So when we look at 2020, let's see a show of hands of how many people want to just forget 2020 ever happened and want to move on. And uh, because it's COVID, 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 COVID. And of course it uh, greatly impacted all of our lives and all of our livelihoods and all that we do. The, the chart that's up there is something we're uh, all too familiar with looking at. That's a national chart. And of course, if you look across the country at all of the individual state charts, you don't see a lot of variation. Uh, it didn't seem to matter too much as to what we did and what we didn't do because it kind of got us all uh, and to the, practically to the same extent. So um, uh, this nasty little virus, uh, again, got into all of our lives and the way we did business and I wanna talk about first, cause I wanna get it out of the way, some of the negative impacts that the pandemic had uh, on us and in our institutions and certainly uh, at Northland here. Um, the very first one and, and most importantly, uh, you know, our collective health. Uh, this impacted uh, the health of our students, our staff, our faculty, uh, the community that we served it affected us all uh, psychologically, uh, affected our mental health, it affected uh, uh, our, the way we do business, uh, financial health. Uh, it, has had, it has taken its toll. We're all weary of the virus. We're all weary of the pandemic. Uh, we're all hopeful. I would believe that uh, we're all hopeful that uh, the vaccine at least is the beginning of the end of this nasty bug and we will, uh, uh, get past all of this. Um, it had 
specific impacts to Northland uh, on our enrollment. Uh, our enrollment this year is down about uh, roughly 10%. Uh, and I want to explain that a little bit. It is not necessarily because people weren't interested in going to college or they felt unsafe in going to college because of the pandemic. Uh, it's down because uh, it's self-inflicted, if you will. Uh, we made the conscious decision to reduce the class size, cap the class size, particularly in our uh, technical coursework where we have to teach with using face-to-face uh, uh, -face methods and, and hands-on learning. Uh, it was not going to be possible to teach welding online uh, or any one of a number of our technical programs needed that face-to-face -face, and we could not keep our students safe if we left, left class sizes at their maximum capacity. So we reduced uh, the amount of uh, capacity for our classes and that affected and impacted our enrollment. Uh, right along with that uh, was athletics. We made the decision to not have fall athletics, to not have winter sports, uh, because we did not believe that we could keep our students and all of those that get involved with athletics safe. Uh, we thought that it potentially would uh, impact community spread by having athletic events during the fall and winter. And uh, we simply don't have the resources at the, you know, in the, at the size institution we are to conduct athletics in a way that would keep everybody and could guarantee that everybody could be safe. So when you decide to not do athletics, that of course is going to impact your uh, enrollment as well. A lot of athletes come not only from around the state, but from around the country uh, to compete uh, for Northland on our teams. And uh, they were not going to make, understandably so, that decision if they, we weren't going to have athletics for them to uh, participate in. There were several initiatives uh, because of COVID uh, and the, the, the pandemic uh, that were either stalled or had to be greatly modified or dropped. Uh, and so new initiatives that had to take the place of what we had previously planned. I, I, can, I can only imagine all of you that uh, work for organizations, large organizations or even small organizations that had a strategic plan in place that basically not just got put on a shelf, but it got tossed in the garbage because you know, our world's changed so significantly because of the pandemic. So there are some new things that we are doing that we hadn't planned on doing. And there are some things that we've had to pause and we'll pick up uh, again uh, after uh, things clear up here, hopefully uh, by the end of this uh, fiscal year anyway. Uh, and speaking fiscally, uh, certainly when you have less enrollment, uh, you're going to have uh, fewer dollars to work with. Uh, we know that the, the state is stressed uh, fiscally, uh, the state of Minnesota. And so therefore we're not expecting uh, great increases coming our way. Uh, in fact, we're hoping that we get uh, uh, minimal decreases in the amount of funding as we look forward. So it certainly has uh, challenged us uh, fiscally with uh, how we're gonna operate the, the college moving forward. Having said all of that, uh, as with any tragedy, any experience uh, that can be viewed first as negative, there are some positive takeaways. And uh, there have been some. We have learned a lot uh, as a result of going through this pandemic together. Uh, first of all, I think we would all have to admit that we are better and uh, 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 we have a, an improved skill set, let's say, in our use of technology. There are folks using uh, the internet uh, beyond uh, what they were using prior to the pandemic. Uh, we're not just learning uh, how to use Zoom, but we're using uh, better ways to take advantage of technology. And I think that actually uh, is, an, uh, is a, an advantage for us all as we move forward. Uh, there are in fact, new ways of doing business. And as a college, I'll just cite uh, one specific example, and that's tutoring. Uh, we discovered uh, that uh, as a result of being in the pandemic and being, being shut down to a lot of uh, traffic, that uh, tutors and the students that need tutoring uh, actually prefer and love the convenience of doing tutoring, tutoring via Zoom. 
you know, it was always a challenge for students to schedule a special trip or an additional trip into campus to meet with a tutor, who, by the way, is often a student uh, or staff that uh, also has to make a special trip into campus so they could meet and do that one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Well, now by using uh, Zoom technology, I don't know that uh, our Academic Success Center will ever go back to, or go back certainly to a much smaller extent, face-to-face -face tutoring, because the students appreciate the convenience and effectiveness uh, of that so well. Uh, we are now doing, uh, we are better at, we've been doing blended instruction for a long time, but we're better at it now. We're using the technology in ways that we haven't used it, and uh, faculty that uh, had, uh, let's say, uh, perhaps uh, resisted uh, using the technology in the past were forced to use it. And uh, they've not only adapted to it, they're uh, kind of thriving in that world. And so students are getting to take full advantage of the convenience of doing some things from their home. And uh, while they're still coming here for face-to-face -face instruction, so we're uh, particularly in the technical skill areas. So we're better at blended instruction and that's a plus, uh, an outcome of this. Business travel, uh, you know, this is a, not, I wouldn't say six, one, half a dozen, the other, but uh, we certainly have saved a lot of money with respect to business travel. Uh, looking at just my own experience every month, I would make the uh, five and a half hour drive to St. Paul, uh, spend two nights in a hotel and five and a half hours back. Not only did I lose time on the road, but the expense and mileage and hotels. And, uh, and when we think about even national conferences, airfare and uh, uh, all of the expenses associated with business travel was greatly reduced. And it was a kind of a positive piece in our budget. Now you can argue about whether there was the value in that uh, trip to St. Paul every month, uh, but I would predict uh, down the road, uh, they won't meet every month now. Now that they can do it so well and are practiced at doing it via Zoom, I think those meetings will happen maybe three or four times a year as opposed to every month in terms of a face-to-face -face interaction. Um, this one, and uh, there's kind of, we still not sure where we are with this, but snow days, I'm almost certain will never be the same. Now that faculty can teach from home uh, and teach via Zoom uh, in lieu of a face-to-face -face class, I'm not sure students will ever see the full benefit, at least they used to see it as a benefit of a snow day. Uh, they at least will not have to uh, travel into campus. We will be uh, perhaps more likely uh, to declare, or maybe less likely, depends on how you look at that, to uh, call a snow day. But those are just some of the things that we're going to, uh, unfortunately, this winter has been so mild, uh, uh, we haven't had to deal with it uh, yet, uh, but that, that's coming. I won't be here for it, but uh, that's coming, and I, I feel bad for all of you. Maybe not too bad. The last thing uh, I would talk about as a positive takeaway is that we now have basically a proven emergency response uh, uh, with respect to pandemics. Uh, how many of you that have sat and uh, worked in uh, large institutions or even medium-sized institutions where you sat through tabletop exercises of what would you do as an organization if a pandemic were to hit? And you go through all those kind of theoretical, we might do this, we would do that, we would do that. And so we were, you know, to some extent prepared, but now that we've experienced in unfortunately a very real way, we are practiced at it. We have learned from it. We've made, we made maybe perhaps some, uh, I don't want to call them mistakes, but we maybe would have done some things differently in the beginning than, we, than uh, we're doing now. And uh, that is a learning experience and that's a value and it's a positive takeaway. So uh, enough talk about COVID. I'm tired about talking about it and you're all tired of hearing about it. So uh, let's move on. Uh, this slide was inspired from a BGEA meeting I sat in just uh, last week uh, ago, and this isn't a, a knock on anybody, but I just feel that the need to put out in front of, because many of the people on this uh, uh, Zoom meeting, presentation, State of the College address, uh, are North Dakota residents and work and live in uh, North Dakota, and we want to, you know, uh, once again emphasize that uh, we are a great partner with North Dakota, and we provide a tremendous amount of support for North Dakota. And I just wanna 
uh, go over again and, and highlight some of the things that uh, sometimes we've got a lot of new players that uh, perhaps don't think about Northland's impact uh, on North Dakota, specifically Grand Forks. Um, and workforce development, uh, the nurses, uh, the respiratory therapists, the physical therapists, long-term care nurses, uh, to list a few, EMT, welders, plumbers, electricians, techs, carpenters, so much of the workforce in uh, Grand Forks uh, is represented by graduates of programs at Northland. Um, we've got programs uh, in cybersecurity. We got uh, all of our aviation programs, uh, aviation maintenance and uh, unmanned aerial systems, um, uh, our business programs. We have many students that, uh, of course, uh, transfer education. Now, I've I've exaggerated a little bit here. Transfer education. I've been. I was told uh, this morning, in fact, that my number is too high that 400 students a year do not transfer from Northland to UND. But you could certainly make an argument that 400 students, uh, UND students, because we have students that come from UND to Northland as guest students, uh, many times during the summer semester to get kind of caught up and get back on track with their studies uh, at UND. So uh, one fact that is true, in fact, this year we have uh, 1,104 students, current Northland students, our North Dakota residents. So we are serving uh, North Dakota and Grand Forks uh, very, very well. And uh, we're a very big part of the workforce development in Grand Forks. Um, so let's move on and talk about the future. Where is Northland headed? And the first place we're headed is that we're out with the current. Now I thought when they handed me this slide that it was a little bit harsh, you know, out with the current that felt uh, almost a little bit painful, but uh, I'm a good sport about it. And, uh, and actually am, am excited about uh, Northland's opportunities as I uh, transition into uh, retirement. Um, I'm not going to spend, uh, you know, a whole bunch of time talking about what my retirement plans are and, and bore you with all of that kind of stuff or even tick off a list of the, the many accomplishments that Northland uh, uh, did accomplish uh, over the five and a half years that I've been here because uh, it's been significant. Um, but I do wanna take this opportunity to thank in a very public way, all of the staff, all of the faculty uh, uh, at Northland uh, for their support uh, and their contributions during this five and a half years. Uh, to make Northland the, the great college that it is. And I want to also, uh, again, thank publicly, not just those sponsors that were uh, listed uh, early in the presentation, but uh, all of the, the uh, public partners that uh, Northland has, the folks at the city of East Grand Forks, uh, Mayor Gander, uh, all of the economic development folks uh, uh, in, uh, at the EDC uh, in North Dakota, Keith and uh, his crew, uh, Barry, the chamber, you've all been uh, wonderful uh, partners to work with. And it's all about, uh, you know, it, it's a community that uh, is emphasized in the success of a community college. And, and uh, we can't live without you. You can't live without us. And uh, we're very fortunate to have a community that's so supportive. And, and uh, the community is very fortunate to have a, a college, the, the quality of uh, Northland. So, um, I now have the honor and the privilege of introducing to you all uh, the interim president at Northland, Dr. Shannon Jesme. And I wanna talk a little bit about her before I give the mic over to her. Uh, she is the current CFO, Chief Financial Officer at Northland Community Technical College. She has been with the college for about 12 years now. She is a longtime area resident having moved here in uh, 1993. So she's been in the area for a long time. Uh, she came to us, uh, she was a Minnesota resident really all her life. Uh, I, I mistakenly uh, referred to her as coming from up on the range, but she goes, no, I'm from the North shore. And it's kind of a status thing over there back in the uh, Arrowhead. And uh, so she's from the North shore originally. Uh, Shannon is uh, amazingly qualified. She has an MBA. She is also a CPA, and she has a PhD in higher education from UND. 
So she's an alumni of UND and it's uh, wonderful to have her having had uh, that view of uh, one of our uh, greatest partners uh, coming into this role. Uh, Shannon uh, is, she's way beyond just knowing her way around a spreadsheet. Uh, and her role at the institution, she's kind of had her fingers in literally every operation at the college. So she has a complete understanding of uh, what happens here at Northland, what makes it tick, what makes it work. And uh, probably most importantly, she has a passion for uh, the students, a passion for the mission of the community college. And uh, she has a uh, just a, a, a big, big heart for students. And if there's one qualification that makes you qualified for this job, it's just that. Uh, her interim uh, assignment will last from now until uh, July 1st, but I'll, I'll let her talk uh, much more about that. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn this over to uh, Shannon. Hello, everybody. I am excited with this opportunity. It's gonna be um, a great learning experience. Um, I'm going to do uh, more than just uh, warm the seat for the next six months. So we've been busy uh, kind of working on what a work plan could look like and what kinds of things um, we will get done in six months. And um, it has been, um, it has been interesting and um, alarming. Uh, you know, the pandemic just continues to change every day. So um, my next slide, Dr. Bona, if you would. Okay, so over the next six months, we've got a lot of things that are just gonna keep going just because uh, Dr. Bona is leaving us, which, you know, congratulations on his retirement and uh, learned a lot from him and he has been a great leader for our institution, but things do continue to move forward. So over the next six months, of course, we'll have the presidential search that is, you know, uh, front and center um, on everybody's mind. And then followed, um, you know, equally, uh, I guess, uh, um, on everybody's mind is the pandemic recovery and how this is going to play out. And we don't have all the answers. Um, I have been spending a lot of my time over the last year on the pandemic, um, led that effort, um, formed a team, quickly realized you had to have a team-based approach. It's just, um, it's just a, a, a big kind of a uh, planning and altering that plan. It was every day we were changing our plan to deal with the, the pandemic and what was coming uh, guidance that was coming to us. But recovery feels a little bit like that too. There's a lot of unknowns. Uh, the timing is the biggest one. It's, the timing is so dependent on the vaccine and um, how that will reach us in our area and who will get it. Um, so we're watching that very, very closely and we'll continue to kind of work through that over the next six months. The recovery um, is more than just instruction. And Dr. Bona talked a lot about how much we've learned. There have been some really interesting ideas um, that have um, then been put into action uh, that have come out of the pandemic that are really, really good and things that are going to stick. But there are an equal number of things that aren't ideal and aren't providing the best services to the students. So I think uh, a big part of pandemic recovery is going to be before um, too much time passes and, we, and we're not in the moment anymore. We need to capture what we've altered, what things were, were for the better, and what things need to go back to the way we did them before. We need to identify that. And then maybe the ones that, you know, maybe it's a hybrid approach between, you know, current and the way things were. We need to, we need to capture that and we need to update our plans um, to reflect what we've learned through this pandemic. Our last sig significant pandemic um, plan was the avian flu. So this is a huge opportunity to update all of that to um, what we've seen this last year. Um, on top of that, I would say that um, resuming student um, life activities and athletics is going to be um, a challenge for us, but one that, that we are ready to do. We need to look at how we can bring um, those activities back on campus, do it safely, of course, understand the timing, um, and get um, student life going again here. It's very, very quiet and it's a rich part of um, our students' lives. So 
that we'll be working on that as well. Um, leadership changes in realignment. Uh, that we have a lot of change that's happening at a college. You know, it's it's kind of a dynamic atmosphere anyways. People are retiring, new people are coming on, uh, programs are changing, that kind of thing. But a president leaving is a major, a major change at our institution. And um, we need to work through that. It's an opportunity though, to look at how um, we're structured and to see if any other changes need to be made. We have a couple of other retirements that will be happening and will be announced. Um, we'll be working on that over the next six months. So uh, the, adapting to the leadership changes and realigning uh, responsibilities is an important uh, role that we play as administration here at the college. Instruction will be the heavy lift um, in a couple of ways. One, if I kind of revert back and talk about the pandemic recovery, there's um, a lot needs to be sorted out uh, about which programs uh, will be coming back onto the campus, which things may stay in a, a high flex delivery, um, working with the faculty on that. And then there are a lot of other things happening within instruction, but I wanna actually have Brian Huschel um, take this uh, bullet here and talk a little bit more about the changes in instruction. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm going to talk about um, four items within our instruction area. Um, and uh, one thing I'll say um, is, while well, a lot of this ties and has direct ties to um, pandemic, pandemic recovery and our response, um, these are all things that um, we're working on as part of our academic planning, independent um, of the pandemic. Um, so first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about, you'll see the CBE, Comp Competency-Based Education. Um, we launched this August um, through um, federal grant support, a new program in mechatronics. Um, and that program is using a comp competency-based model where it's fractionalized credit and open entry. And so what that means is students can take just the skill sets they need down to a quarter um, of a credit, quarter of one credit hour, um, up to a full credit at a time. And they can start any time during the semester. Um, we do have closed exit. And so they need to complete what they start by the end of the semester. There's nuances tied in around that with financial aid. But um, this flexibility really meets um, industry need um, for direct industry training within our program. We had a great meeting earlier this week with our advisory board, which includes many of the regional manufacturers. And we're seeing uh, more of them getting ready to bring um, their workforce into the program, um, even as we're speaking. And so that's just great news. And um, this year, we're adding welding. So our, um, one of our welding faculty is working, developing their program into that competency-based model using fractional credit. The lab part of this type of model is a flex lab. So the hours vary during the week so students can fit it around their work schedules. Um, and then the um, lecture part is a delivery um, where the students can do online with videos that the instructors prepare. Um, and so they have that flexibility to do that and then interact with the faculty directly in the labs and pick up those skills, ask the questions they have. And so it's gonna be a great model going forward, we think um, serving the industry, but it's also designed in a way that the traditional student can come in, um, have financial aid and work their way through the program. Um, Next is our Z degree. The Z stands for zero textbook cost. We launched this in August after four years of grants and work by faculty um, developing zero textbook cost classes, whether they're using open resources or free resources. Um, a couple of highlights about that. Right now, um, I have on record, or we have on record at the college, over 70 courses that are OER. Um, you look at that in an average national textbook cost of $100 a course, and you look at the students, we're saving students hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, just in textbook cost. Um, so it's a great benefit to our students, um, but there's other advantages. Um, the students on day one have access to that textbook material in the course. They don't have to wait till they can afford to buy a textbook. They, get, they log into the course shell with that class and the text is there for them. Um, 
And while we have a degree pathway, the Z degree pathway to get the Associate of Arts at zero textbook cost, it benefits pretty much all of our students. Any of our students who take one of those classes, uh, and most of them do for a general education requirement in their technical programs, any of those students benefit from this program. So it's a great benefit across the board, and it really reflects the dedication and willingness, hard work of our faculty to do what's right for the students in this project. Um, our exercise science pathway, um, this is gonna be a new degree that we launched this August. It's an Associate of Science transfer degree, and it automatically transfers to our state university partners in Minnesota. Um, we're doing this um, new degree and it will help support our bringing back of student athletes in the fall onto the campuses. This will be a program that will help support them. But um, the other thing I wanna highlight about this program is we will develop an articulation with UND and note that in the last 12 months, we have developed 12 new articulation agreements with UND for our programs going into UND. So we're looking to add this one there and it's gonna be um, a great benefit for our student athletes as well as many other students. Um, the final thing I wanna highlight is our um, high flex program delivery. Um, now, of course, last March when we went all remote um, and then starting this fall, we had to have a lot of um, courses go to high flex. And I just wanna say what we mean by high flex is the student has that flexibility to attend in person a lecture or by Zoom online. And so we have many, many lecture courses that we started this fall in that mode. Um, and we're doing the same for spring semester at the course level. But we were doing high flex before it was cool. We had um, two programs, our administrative professional program and our sales, I'm sorry, our marketing and management program, both at the program level. So students could go through the whole program in a high flex model prior to the pandemic. And we have a third one, respiratory therapy that brought that online this August. And we have two more who are exploring that, bringing that online at the program level for this coming year. And so um, while this is a kind of a, the pandemic ramped it up at the course level for many, many faculty, um, we have many program areas that are doing this. And at the program level, I wanna note, it's not always just like Zoom. Don't, I want you to get Zoom out of your head for the program level. Because what HyFlex means at that level isn't necessarily the student has to be there synchronously. Um, our programs who have developed this so far have the flexibility for the student to be at the same time in, in person or online and not at the same time. And so it really gives that maximum flexibility, that high flex to our students to be successful in those programs. Um, and some of the programs like um, respiratory, they still have some commitments for the lab to be on on certain days of the semester, but it really allows that um, those students to attend when they can, where they can, and um, get the um, degree. And so with that, I'll um, turn that, this back over to Shannon. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. So this next bullet, prep work and data mining, um, I'll explain this a little bit. When I spoke with the chancellor about what an interim president could do, should do, is expected to do, uh, we had a good conversation. And um, I pitched a few ideas, and uh, this is the one that seemed like it would be the most beneficial. I didn't wanna just keep the seat warm. I wanted to do something. A six month interim gives, it's a good amount of time to do a project and um, do something for um, a president that's coming in. And so what I'm looking at doing is looking at pulling a team together, um, concentrating on academics and identifying the strengths and opportunities of the two communities and the two campuses. They're very different. Um, laying that out with data uh, so that the president, when they come in, has kind of a full understanding of here's what the two campuses look like right now, here's how they're different, and here's some opportunities um, that is backed by data around opportunities for growth, expansion, uh, change, that kind of thing. And so we'll be working on that. We'll hit the 
hit the ground running right after the first. And that's kind of my identified project for the next six months. My last uh, bullet is about things that um, are, are happening. They just uh, are happening on our campus over the next uh, six months, 12 months. We have a couple of um, capital projects. One um, is a hope. Uh, we're putting in again um, for a project that did not get funded uh, through the last couple of bonding um, rounds with the state of Minnesota. And it is to, um, it's called our Effective Teaching and Learning Labs Project and it's on the East Grand Forks campus. We're um, updating it right now. It needs to be submitted in January to go into the next bonding cycle. We're hoping it'll get funded. It's a, a nearly a $3 million project. It would update um, our allied health labs here in East Grand Forks, our computer networking space, our early childhood space. It's just much, much needed. So that one's kind of a hope, a hope for us. And we'll continue to work on that and get our proposal in and cross our fingers and hope for the best. The second project is a HEPR project. Um, that's a higher ed asset preservation and recovery kind of a project. Uh, it has no debt repayment to the state. Um, they're typically used for things like roofs and um, updates to uh, air systems and that kind of thing. We did get funded for that, for the Thief River Falls project. And this one as well, it has been an ask of ours for a long time. And um, we were, have already been awarded it and we expect this to start in March. It's a $371,000 project. And um, it will, uh, the name of the project is Door and Building Security Upgrades Locks. Um, and it uh, is gonna update our security system. I think that's the major takeaway. And finally, we can get these two campuses to be on uh, similar protocols around security door locks, um, the way people access the building. And we've just really needed to get that completed. East Grand Forks campus is 100% um, complete and has been for a couple of years, but the Thief River Falls campus has many spaces that do not have a way to electronically um, shut down the, um, or access um, the site. So that is a project that will start in March and, and um, we'll be monitoring that as well. So anyways, um, Dennis, do you want to advance the slide? <laughs> <We're all good. laughs> okay. No, after uh, 10 and a half years as a college president, I didn't want my last public speech to be a Zoom speech. Uh, I have to be honest about that. But anyway, thank you all for uh, attending today. Uh, wish you all a, a warm and wonderful uh, holiday season. Uh, do the best you can, given uh, the circumstances and... Uh, I'll miss everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Miss you too, Dennis. <laughs>